time to talk about a classic of classics, Brian De Palma's 1980 Dressed to Kill. This Blu-ray, by the way, looks fantastic. It is crystal clear, so pick it up. It's not Shop Factory. I don't know who it is, but whoever it is, maybe it's just MGM. I don't know, but it's awesome. Like This looks like it was made today. So this is a mystery thriller slasher movie. From 1980, of course, and I've been watching a lot of 1980 movies recently. That's why I watched this one again, because I'm making a top 10 1980s horror movie list. And this is up there. Like, this is a, almost like a masterpiece movie. Like, there's nothing wrong with this movie at all. It is awesome. I do have a couple little nitpicks, but that's it. But the things that I like about this movie, let's get into it. No plot synopsis. I'm sure you've heard about the movie. You know what it's about. All right. So... The things I like about this movie is Brian De Palma's style. Like, he has his own style. He's definitely got some influences. Like, he's got some Hitchcockian things in here. And even a uh, tribute to Halloween, which is, this is like two years after that. But, yeah, I just love his style. I love the camera work and some of the visuals within I love when he does all that, like, you know, he puts, like, one image over another. Like, or like I don't know what it's called because I'm not a filmmaker. You know, I just like to watch movies and talk about them. But he does this thing where also, uh, like, the focus is on this person way in the background. And then there's, there's a focus on someone more in the foreground. There's a shot like that in Black Christmas when uh, Margot Kiddo is, like, Kiddo? Kidder? <laughs> Margot Kidder. Like, she's, like, feeding alcohol to some kid. Meanwhile, there's a guy in the foreground, like, on the phone. Like, he borrowed a little bit from Bob Clark, maybe. But he's, he does a lot of that. Like, I just love his style. You know, that's the big thing that I took away from this movie. Is it's very stylish. From, you know, the cinematography work and the camera work. It just, it looks amazing. It's a very well shot movie. It's a little leisurely paced. It takes its time. But I just, I adore the style of Brian De Palma. I'm becoming a huge De Palma fan here. And there's a very stylish kill in the movie. This, this isn't about a body count or anything. But the kill we do get in this movie is done almost like psycho in a way, but more, you know, modern day and more, a little bit more graphic. You actually get to see like practical effects, like actual slits happening on screen, like slices on skin and stuff, but not that like, you know, violent. It's not that graphic. It's not like a Friday the 13th or anything. It's definitely more graphic than psycho, which is an influence definitely that was, you know, present here like it this very much feels like he was inspired because this is a shocking kill that happens like in the middle of the movie a character that you don't think is gonna die but then they die you're like oh shit there's like a whole you know hour left in the film and this person just died so i like that you get like a stylish shocking kill in the film and i like that it's a whodunit i like the mystery this Brian De Palma is very excellent at storytelling. Like, this is a very engaging story. I was never bored. It's, it, it kind of flew by for me. I mean, it does, like I said, it is a little leisurely paced in the beginning, like with the whole art gallery thing. Maybe that's boring for some people, but it's all stylistic, and I just, I love, you know, his direction and the, the storytelling here. Like, it's excellent. It's an excellently written script. It's very cleverly written in... The performances are fantastic also. Like, you got a good cast with great performances. You got the guy from Psycho 2, uh, Dennis Franz. I, I love that guy. Just any movie he's in, I love his presence. I love his characters. They're always, like, over the top or, like, annoying, and they're just loud mouths. And he plays a little bit of a loud mouth here. I just I love his character. And the music by uh, Pin... Pin is it pronounced Pino or Pino? I don't know. Pino Donaggio. He does a lot of films. Like he even did See the Chucky. I recognize that name. And I think he did Tourist Strap. He's done all kinds of films. But this is a wonderful score. And it's even got some erotic moments in the movie, some nudity. You get to see Nancy Allen naked, so no no complaints here. And this whole movie opens up with a shower scene, so it's very erotic. And there is some really good nail-biting tension in a couple of moments. I think Brian De Palma really knows how to like build suspense and just let scenes breathe. This movie just had me on the edge of my seat in a couple of moments. Like This is a very well-crafted flick. So if you hate this movie, I don't understand why that is. This is just almost flawless. The only two little nitpicks I have with the movie is that... I thought the killer was obvious, but that's just me. Like, when you see the killer, 1080p, Blu-ray, like, the killer's in drag. I don't think that's a spoiler. I mean, no, it's not. Yeah. 
you know that the killer's in drag, but you don't know who the killer is. But when you see the killer, you recognize the face, even with all the makeup on. Like, you know who the killer is. I mean, I did. So that was just my little gripe with it. It's like, I wish they would have done something to make it a little less obvious. Because I just was, I looked at the person in makeup. I was like, isn't that that one character? It's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> and I feel like this movie didn't have to add on that last, like, 10 minutes or so. Like, there was a moment where the movie could have ended, and I would have been just happy. But then they decided... You know, Brian De Palma wanted to add an extra, like, five, ten minutes and then, you know, do this. I'm not going to spoil it here, but I was just like, okay, well, it didn't really need to end there. I feel like I feel like the movie could have ended at this one spot and it would have been just fine. So I just felt like the last ten minutes was a little unnecessary. But final thoughts, this is a fantastic movie with great tension and a very good cast, great performances. It's a mystery whodunit, very engaging story. Lots of little familiar faces that have just little cameos in it. People from Friday the 13th and all, all these other movies, like Christmas Evil even. So I was seeing people, I was like, oh shit, that person, oh, that person. I was having a really good time watching this movie. It's even humorous at times, and the humor works. Everything works in this movie. Tension, suspense, the you know, acting, the cinematography. This is just a very well put together movie, and... It really is just a, almost a masterpiece. Just my little couple of nitpicks, and that's it. So when it comes to Dress to Kill, highly recommend checking this one out. If you have it, go out and buy it. All right, now let's go through a spoiler discussion. This will probably be quick. I don't have too much to say here. Um, so this movie opens up right away with gratuitous nudity, like lots of full frontal nudity. You see Bush. Everything, the whole works. And that was a body double. I read into that. That was supposedly like a playboy or a playmate that they hired for the body double for Angie uh, Dickinson. And yeah, and then it's a dream sequence. This movie opens up with a dream sequence and then it ends with a dream sequence. So that could have been another nitpick earlier, but because I don't like dream sequences, but I get this one. I don't really care for the last, you know, the dream sequence at the end. Why was that needed? And then we see Arnie from Christine. Uh, that was cool to see him, and then he was also in Jaws too, and he's a uh, he's the nerd in this movie. He's got all these gadgets that he's putting together, and then she goes to the therapist played by Michael Kang, and she asks him basically if he would like to have sex with her. Like she's t complaining about her sex life, and she just flat out asks Michael Kang, like, "Would you like to have sex with me? Like, would you? Are you interested?" And that's what gets her killed. That's what we find out later on. She aroused him. So he had to kill her. And, but yeah, she goes to the museum basically hoping to find somebody to screw. Like she's going there with the intention to cheat on her husband because he's a lousy lay. But she just goes to the museum. She's people watching. And then she like throws her glove on the ground hoping that some guy will pick it up, give it to her. And it'll be like a conversation starter. Like, oh, thank you for the glove. Want to have sex? <laughs> but there's like, it's a very like drawn out sequence. So I can see this scene you know, boring some people, but the music's what really keeps the, you know, the flow going. Like, it just keeps the pace going. I, I really love the music. I already said that before, but the music's fantastic. And, but she just follows this guy outside the museum, and we get a quick shot of the killer, which I thought was pretty cool, just keeping him in the background. It's very subtle. You wouldn't even notice it on the first watch. And she goes in the cab, and they just immediately start having sex like like foreplay in the back of this taxi just like caressing each other's thighs he's taking her panties off in the cab <laughs> it's like the taxi doesn't the taxi driver doesn't even care like he sees it every day it's not even phased and then she goes there has sex with this stranger who she never even really spoke to they said nothing to each other it's like they just read each other's minds like are you thinking what i'm thinking Let's go. And then she, like, finds out that he has an STD right before she dies. Like, <laughs> she was already having the worst day ever. She found out that she was most likely going to have, like, an STD, and then she gets in the elevator, and I guess Michael Caine, spoiler, he's the killer, he's just been waiting for hours out there by the elevator, waiting for her to come by, and then he slashes her, like, cuts her hand wide open, cuts her throat, cuts her cheek, like, he's just cutting at her again and again, blood splashing up on the... The elevator numbers, very well crafted, well shot scene, very much like Psycho, you know, the music and just the shocking kill, the main character being dead, like 30 minutes in the film. 
And so, yeah, like, how long was he going to wait there? Like, what if she stayed there, like, another day or something? I don't know. Like, how long was he waiting there? This guy's patient as fuck. And then Nancy Allen witnesses the murder, and then she becomes, like, suspect number one. So she's got, like, 48 hours to go find the real killer and clear her name. Otherwise, she'll be behind bars. And then we get the crazy voicemail on uh, Michael Caine's answering machine, which is the red herring. You think it's this crazy transvestite named Bobby, but Bobby is really Michael Caine. Um, so, M Mr. Toomey plays the detective here. Mr. Toomey from uh, Psycho 2. <laughs> and then I love the dialogue between uh, Mr. Toomey and Michael Caine. I mean, he starts asking him, like, personal questions. So then he asks him a personal question back, and he's like, I don't answer that. He's like, well, that's exactly how I feel about your questions. It's personal, so shut the fuck up. And the dad seems kind of happy that his wife died. Like, Arnie, and that's not his name, but he seemed upset. He's got this clever device up against the wall so he can, like, eavesdrop on the conversation. Very clever kid. But the dad, he's just got, like, a little smile on his face. Like, all right, come on, son, let's go. Like, he doesn't care that his cheating wife just died. And then the son, he's got, like, this whole system set up. He's got, like, a bicycle that's taking, it has, like, a hidden camera taking pictures. He's got a stopwatch. He's, like, taking all these notes. He's got blueprints. He is motivated to find his mom's killer. And I totally understand. I would probably be doing the same thing. Not the same thing exactly because I'm not that smart, but I totally buy what he's doing, like, I would do that too if I was that smart. And then you get all the split screen stuff, very Brian De Palma. And we see the actor from Christmas Evil, which is a movie I recently reviewed. And he's in here for like a second. Like he's in and then he's out. He's like hiring a prostitute. So yeah, and then right after that, you see Jeff from Friday the 13th Part 2. He's the taxi driver. So that was pretty cool. I love his character in here. He, he just knocks this cop right on her ass. Like, She's being followed by this undercover cop, and when she's walking up by the taxi, Jeff, he opens up the car door, and she falls, like, flat on her face. Like, she never even put her arms out. Like, naturally, you would try to prevent the fall, like, you know, put your hands out, but this chick, she just falls flat on her face, like a statue, or like a tree, just fell. <laughs> like, she fell like a tree. It was, like, ridiculous. It made me laugh out loud. It's like, really? Your arm's not working? Okay, and then, yeah, we get this whole, like, train sequence, and Arnie saves the day. He's got, like, this weird, like, pepper spray thing. And, yeah, Nancy's having the worst day. Like, she's, that's not her name, but Nancy Allen, uh, Liz, she's getting chased by a killer, an uh, undercover cop, and now she's got to deal with this gang that wants to, like, rape her just because she was too close to them. Like, this gang is crazy. But the taxi driver, uh, Jeff from Friday the 13th Part 2, He's like, I'll call you. And they never exchange numbers. So it's like, how are you going to call her? He's like, I I'll call you. It's like, okay. And so then the doc, uh, Michael Caine, goes to the asylum. He's like convinced that it's Bobby. He's completely unaware that Bobby is him, I guess. Split personality disorder. But yeah, so that whole scene is there to basically divert your attention to Bobby once again and not make you think that it's Michael Caine. But I knew it was Michael Caine the whole time. And then we get one of the better scenes in the movie where Liz, played by Nancy Allen, is stripping. She's in some sexy lingerie. You can almost see her nipple, like, hanging out of her bra. You can see, like, her areola. And then we get the reveal that Michael Caine's the killer. He gets shot by the undercover cop who's been trailing Nancy Allen. And then we get the whole, like, psycho exposition scene that from the end of Psycho with the cop is, like, explain. Well, in this case, it's the doctor explaining everything. So it's very psycho. And then this is when the movie should have ended. Just end it there. End it like Psycho. There you go. Over. You know? But no, we have to continue. We get this comedic scene at the dinner, their conversation. They're talking about, like, sex changes and whatnot, how, it, how it's done. And then the old people ne uh, at the table next to them are, like, disgusted because she's talking about how they slit penises open and, like, you know, do all kinds of gnarly shit. And then we see the doc escaping the mental asylum and then stalking her at the house outside the house it's very much halloween like mental patient escapes asylum and then we get the shot of the house the guy walking up towards the house around the side looking through the window seeing people inside it very john carpenter's halloween and and then it turns out all to be a dream which is yeah 
I don't care for that. And then, yeah, it's like, but I like the scene, like the tension in it when she 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 sees the shoes, and then she's just like so scared. She doesn't even want to like leave the shower. She doesn't know what to do. She's like, I'm trapped. It's a very well shot scene. It's very tense. But then it's all a dream. Like she gets her throat slit and then she wakes up. And it's like, meh. Like, did we really need the last five, ten minutes of the movie? Can anyone explain why it was necessary? I feel like the movie could have ended with the whole exposition scene at the end. Uh, yeah, but that's just my thought. So the hockey mask award for best character in this movie for me was Detective Moreno. Love this character actor. He's just hilarious to me. And the hanky award for worst character in this movie is the STD given douchebag that Angie Dickinson picks up at the museum. And the clapper award for best scene in this movie will probably be the shock kill in the middle with the elevator scene, all that stuff. Very excellent scene. And the hottest chick in this movie, of course, for me, was Liz Blake, played by Nancy Allen. And those are my thoughts on Dress to Kill. What are your thoughts on this De Palma classic? Is it your favorite De Palma film? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you like what you've seen, you can hit this like button and become a subscriber today just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And until next time, Alpha Venusy.